everybody. Uh, many faces uh, are all familiar to us here, but we have some guests who joined us this evening. Thank you for coming to this lecture. Um, I am really excited that we uh, have this, the, for the first time ever in our 16 years, we have a virtual lecture. And the reason that we're having this virtual lecture is that the foremost scholar um, in the world on the organology of the physicality of the three, uh, at least two of the medieval harps, the Queen Mary harp and the Lavish harp, is joining us from Princeton, New Jersey, Dr. Karen Lewis. Um, Karen completed her PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I think about two years ago, Karen, was that correctly? More than that now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so maybe three years ago, uh, she's since moved back to the USA. Uh, she's often with us here uh, at our summer festival. She's also the secretary to the governing board of the Historical Heart Society of Ireland, so she works very closely with us. And she's about to head up a project with the national, uh, for a proposal uh, to the National Museum of Ireland to measure all of the existing harps that are at the museum via using cutting edge, uh, cutting edge laser technology. So uh, without it carrying on any further, because she has far more interesting things to say than I do, I give you Dr. Karen Lewis. Thank you. Robertson's is that she married into the family. 
um, and that's how they came to have it. Um, there's no corroborating evidence, though, that, that this gift of the harp from Mary Prince Bob's actually occurred. So we don't know that that happened. This is just according to the Robertson family tradition. This is part of their, their own family history. Um, the, what we do know, or at least have surmised, based on, again, on the decorative work of the harp, is that it is probably older than Mary Queen Scots. But again, we didn't know. This was just educated guessing. If you could click forward one. Nice. Uh, so we, based on the best guesses, uh, we, we've so far been saying that it, it's circa 15th century. And again, that circa is an enormous circa. It, you know, it could be way newer or way older. We literally didn't even couldn't say for a certain what century this part belonged to. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of scale, that's me about five years ago standing next to the harp in the museum. I'm small, so I make objects look larger than they actually are. <laughs> <laughs> that helps you give you a general idea of how big it is. It's a little bit smaller than the harp at Trinity College in Dublin. If I can have the next slide, please. Okay, if you could uh, click forward one. So Mary Queen of Scots, uh, she was she was uh, Queen of Scotland in the 16th century. If you could click forward one more, uh, she was queen from uh, 1542 to 1557. Click, please. She actually spent most of her childhood in France. Uh, clip, please. Where she was married to the Dauphin, Francis II, until he died, I believe, of ear infection. He actually died quite young. Um, so she returned to France, click, please, uh, in 1561 after his death. And um, pretty soon afterwards, fell afoul of Queen Elizabeth and ended up in the Tower of London for the latter part of her life until she had her uh, head chopped off. If I could have the next slide, please. Okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it, we, we think of that this harp may have originated in the West Highlands of Scotland, and that's based on the style of decorative work, uh, especially on the pillar and uh, on part of the sound box. If you could click forward for me one. So that little box there shows, there's a close-up of the, the decorative work on the four pillar. If you could click forward one more. And here's a, a the picture on the right is a part of a, a cross shaft uh, on the island of Iona. This, this would have been the shaft of High Cross. And you can see the uh, similarity in decorative work. And then that cross dates to, it's actually inscribed uh, with a petshit and a date. And uh, so we know that that dates to 14, I think it's 1489. Um, um, and this is typical of what's called West Highland monumental sculpture uh, that was. Uh, that was around for actually fairly. This style was around for a fairly uh, wide time period. Uh, this particular style spans uh, the 14th and the 15th centuries, especially. Um, but that's where um, that's why we think that the art probably originated there. If I could have the next slide, please. Okay, so where is the West Highlands and uh, where is Iona? If you could click forward one for me. So there's Iona. It's this tiny island in the inner Hebrides off the west coast of Scotland. And it was actually um, it's, it's a, it's an important place because it was a medieval center of both pilgrimage and learning and also of um, because of there were a lot of people and goods coming through there, uh, it was on a trade route. There was it was also a center of, of 
artisans and artistic craft. And it's possible that this car may, and for the decorative work on this car, may have been done in or around Iona. Um, another piece of evidence linking this car possibly with, with this area, if I can have the next slide, please, is there's actually, not far from Iona, on the west coast of Scotland, a grave slab from the uh, late 15th century that depicts a, a heart that uh, is very similar to the, you know, the style of the early Irish hearts, a heart like the Queen Mary, including with the decorative carving shown on the sound box. Um, so, all, so also possibly linking this heart to this area, or hearts like it to this area, I should say. If I have the next slide, please. So where is Keels? Keels is actually right there on the west coast of Scotland there. That shows you its proximity to Iona. So very much in the same area. If I have this next slide, please. I the forward one. There are um, so the, the decorative work on the harp is not all of one style. There are the four pillar has this lovely um, uh, motifs uh, that are in the style of the uh, West Highland Monument of Sculpture, and that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, but the sound box and the neck, most of the sound box have these geometric patterns that are of different style and actually they were done using different tools. Um, so that was actually one of the uh, reasons that we decided to, me and me, 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 the museum, decided to pursue the dating because we were wondering, do all, is the four pillar original to the park or was it made somewhere else? Uh, later, you know, does it date to the same period? Is it a replacement? You can see that there, there's a little bit of decorative work at the top of the sound box that, that is in the same design as the um, four pillar, but uh, there's this other other motif, the, the geometrical motif is different. Um, so that was actually one of the questions that we were hoping to answer with the stating is do all three parts of the frame, a sound box, four pillar, and neck, do they all date to the same time period? If I can have the next slide, please. And this is just showing the a close up of the decorative work on the four pillar and on the top of the sound box. You can see the similarity there. The rest of the sound box, I said, those geometric designs compasses great edges. I like that next slide, please. Okay, so why are we doing this? Uh, it, not just about being able to put a date on a museum label next to a display. It's about much more than that. Um, the early Irish art has a history of use that spans several centuries. Uh, from the medieval period right up through the end of the 18th century into the early 19th century. And it's, I probably don't need to tell this audience, but it, it's central to the cultural heritage of um, the Gaelic world in Ireland and Scotland. Um, if I can have the next slide, please. There are 18 known surviving early Irish arts, including fragments. Most of those, if you could click forward for me, thanks. Most of those date to the last century of the tradition, the final century. Um, so, and are actually more similar in form to this, this one here. This is, if you could, if you could click forward one for me. Great, thanks. This is the Sir Hart, and it's of a, it's what we call a high-headed early Irish heart. It, it swoops up towards the, towards the base end, 
as opposed to the low headed early iron sharp, which is an earlier form. We know the low headed harps are earlier, but we don't know how, you know, we don't know how old the early surviving specimens are. There are three um, that are believed to be particularly early. Um, that's the one of those is the Queen Mary harp. The other two, if I could have, if you if I could have the next slide, please. And you can click forward one. Thanks. The other two are the Trinity College harp, also known as the Brian DeRue harp. It's a Trinity College in Dublin, and the Lama harp, which I don't show here. We, it's been understood for a, quite a long time that these are older than those later harps, but we really don't. We, we didn't know how old they are. How much older? 100 years older? 200? Like, we don't, we literally did not know what century these instruments belong to. And why, you know, why does that matter? Well, if we're trying to um, understand and recreate for performance and for our, you know, our knowledge of the uh, music and cultural heritage of these instruments, and if we're actually working from an early repertory, which you'll be doing this week, um, we want to know what century that instrument belongs to so that we can understand what repertory or what style of repertory is contemporary with that harp. If we're using, as you know, some of you will be using um, student trinities this week probably, and uh, some of you maybe have replicas of the Queen Mary harp, and we use our, our, our replicas, our reconstruction of early Irish harps to help us um, understand and reconstruct and work with this early repertory. We, we, we need to know, and we haven't known, what century these harps actually belong to. We really didn't know for sure. We could make some educated guesses, but we didn't know. Um, and if we can if we can find out what century they belong to at the very least, or what time period, uh, that not only helps us understand the music that is contemporary to the instrument and how we can, you know, how the how the instrument informs the, the way we construct the music, but also how does the craftsmanship fit in with the time period? Um, uh, you know, how does it compare with things, other instruments that, it, that might be contemporary to it? So there are all sorts of things that we can understand better if we at least know how old these instruments are. We haven't known that. So uh, if I can have the next slide, please. And go ahead and click forward. Okay, so. You could, so I, I uh, got together with the National Museum and we assembled a team. Uh, if I could, if you could click forward. Go ahead and click forward. And click again. So the National Museum of Scotland, I got together with David Forsyth and uh, from Charles Stable, go ahead and click forward. And we uh, collaborated with Scottish University's Environmental Research Center. And you can go ahead and click forward a couple times. Go ahead, thanks. Gordon Cook, who is actually the head, or one of the heads, and Derek Hamilton. And you can go ahead and click forward again. And one more time. And uh, we also brought in a dental chronologist from AOC Archaeology Group, uh, not to do dendro chronology, actually the, the types of woods that the park frames made out of aren't uh, appropriate for doing dendro chronology. We, we can't do it with these woods, but we did bring her in to help in selecting the sampling sites for the radiocarbon dating. As a bonus, she uh, also uh, went through and completed the woods identification for the Queen Mary Park. I have the next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is where the samples were taken. We took a sample from each of the uh, three parts of the heart. And if I you, you could click forward for me. And um, so the four pillar sample was taken in an area of the four pillar, and that's the curved part of the heart where the arrow is pointing. Uh, that spot already had a section of wood missing, so there was raw, uh, not raw, but uh, there was a part of the interior was exposed and, and uh, undecorated, unworked surface. Um, so a sample was taken there. Uh, we tried to minimize the impact on the instrument at all times. So do you could click forward once for me? And one more time. Thanks. Um, we also took, we took the sample of the sound box from the interior of the sound box and the sample of the neck was taken from the end of the neck tenon that actually juts into this inside of the sound box. Um, the samples, these are micro, very, very small samples. Uh, radar carbon dating methods have advanced to the point where sample size can be quite small, much smaller than it used to be. So the samples were roughly 10 or so milligrams <coughs> of small plates and splinters. And if you were to imagine how big that would be in terms of volume, uh, imagine a cube about two and a half to three millimeters on the side. So that's how much we took out of and the sample does get used up in the dating process. So that's why we needed to minimize the impact on the instrument. But we felt that it was, it was worth it for what we were hoping to do that. If I have the next slide, please. Okay, so let me say just a few quick words about radiocarbon dating so that you can understand the results a little bit better. Um, the way it works is um, carbon uh, occurs as a stable isotope, but also as an unstable isotope, which is carbon-14. It's a naturally occurring isotope in the atmosphere, um, and it slowly decays down to stable forms of carbon. So it's, it's radioactive. Um, and many organisms, you and me, trees, take in, as we breathe, carbon from the atmosphere and leave it up, expel it out. And we're constantly exchanging with the atmosphere while, while we're alive. And this is while a tree is alive, it's constantly exchanging carbon with the atmosphere. As soon as that tree dies, or as soon as that piece of wood is no longer part of the respirating part of the tree, that is if it's in the interior, not in the actual outer growth ring, then that amount of carbon-14 gets locked in, and it will then slowly decay over time in a very regular known fashion, with a half-life that's known. And that's basically how we're able to date um, objects using carbon-14. It only works on living things that have been alive. It only works on organic objects. Um, the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere is, has been, is known historically, and that's, that is used to calibrate the date. The amount in the atmosphere has fluctuated over time, so there's a little, there are wobbles in the calibration curve. And what that means is that uh, as, as the data gets calibrated, what, um, what we do with the samples is actually measure the number of carbon-14 atoms that are left uh, and calculate that to how much in time that would have been. Uh, and, um, but if we hit a little wobble in the calibration curve, you can end up with two possible answers. So basically what you're doing is you're drawing a horizontal line across that graph that you see there. And you can see there's little wobbles in that line there, and it's possible for your line to cross the calibration curve at two points, which means you get two answers. I have to tell you that because you get two answers. If I can have the 
the next slide, please. So what do we get? Okay, so uh, if you could uh, click forward, one. Okay, I need to look at my end here. Okay, so the sound box, which is Willow. We got, uh, again, it, it, our needed cross the calibration curve are two points. So um, there are two cross abilities. And this has been calibrated, and the numbers I'm giving you show uh, that the, the piece of wood, this is the date of the sample, okay? That's the, the date of that particular piece of wood, uh, with a 95% probability falls within either 1302 to 1367, or 1382 to 1406. So either early 14th, early to mid 14th century, or uh, late. But you could click forward one. The neck, which our endocrinologist identified as either at or pair, and actually, um, I'll tell you. So she identified that this is something that we weren't sure of before. Uh, but she went back through all of our imagery and did a microscopic identification. Um, and she identified it as either pyrus malus, which is apple, or pyrus communis, which is pear. Um, it's actually difficult to tell the difference between those two species on microscopic level. But uh, we're, we're fairly certain that it's one of those two. Uh, the neck, uh, again, the neck sample, not the whole neck, but the neck sample, dates between 1285 to 1320. So, very early 14th century, or 1350 to 1392, so or late 14th century. If I could, if you could click forward one, the four pillars. Uh, it was difficult for her to identify the four pillar wood species. This has been a problem. The four pillar is actually a branch. Uh, so it's a very young piece of brown wood, and I, there's also a knot in there in the area um, where we're able to sample, which has complicated the microscopic identification somewhat. Um, so we weren't able to pin it down to one species. Like we see. It's either corn bean or a, one of the sorbus species, uh, white bean or service tree. And actually, Sorbus terminalis, which is known commonly as wild service tree or checker tree, I think is a is a a good candidate. It was it's actually native to uh, not to Scotland but to England, Wales, and, and parts of continental Europe, and it has for a long time been uh, prized as a fine grained uh, wood for uh, uh, furniture and turning, but also. Uh, for having very high bending strength. And it's a, you know, it's a dense uh, fine grain wood. And that actually you know, matches the density and the, and the tight grain matches what we observe. So that I, I personally think that's a uh, good possibility. Um, anyway, the four pillar uh, sample, uh, we found that uh, radiocarbon date puts it in the early uh, to mid 14th. Early to mid 14th century or the uh, late 14th century, which is early 15th century. Now, as I said, that's the sample. And this is what the actual, if I can have the next slide, please. This is what the um, actual data looks like. And um, just to see, just so you can see, it's a spread of likely dates. If I could have the next slide. Okay, so that's just the sample, but we want to know how will this harm? Well, the first thing we have to do is we need to take into account where the sample is taken inside that block of wood. Um, because if you imagine for a moment, if you have a big oak tree that's like 200 years old, lots and lots of growth rates, and you take a sample from the middle of that oak tree, and 
radiocarbon dated. And then you take another sample from way out at the edge, you know, near, near the bar, and you radiocarbon date that. They're going to be 200 years apart. Okay? So just, you know, the date you get depends on where the sample is taken in the wood. You have to count rings and, and add that up. So that's what I did. Uh, this is one of the CT scans that I took of the Queen Mary Park. And I used that to count growth rings. If you could, let's see, if you could, uh, next slide please. So this slide shows the growth rings where that cover the period where that sample was taken. It's actually taken at the opposite end of the imprint, but it's this set of growth rings. And so what I did is I counted out and I actually sat down with a horticulturalist who uh, and went over the growth rings with him um, and also um, had him look at the pattern of growth rings. And, and um, what he told me was, uh, you could, you know, you can count the growth rings out to the edge of the sound box, but you know, how how big was the trunk that this came from? In other words, does it go out much farther than that? Because uh, we want to know when this tree was felled. You know, if you could count the growth rings from the sample all the way up to the bark, you could tell when the tree was felled. Um, but how, you know, where is the edge of the tree trunk there? And uh, he had a look at the growth pattern, and he said that the, this tree was actually in decline. When, uh, and you can see, he could see that it was likely felled within five years of the outermost ring that I could see in the sandbox. And, um, one note uh, he, that he made was that willow, which is what this is, once it dies, it very quickly rots from the inside out. So it's like it's likely, in his opinion, that the sound box was that the wood for, to make the sound box was used fairly soon after it was felled. You know, by fairly soon I mean not 50 years after it was felled. You know, within a, a reasonably short time frame after it was felled. So, so this isn't a tree trunk that was cut down and, and sat for 50 or 100 years and then somebody decided to make it into a sound box. And uh, furthermore. We're fairly certain that um, the the time from the time frame from where the sample was taken and when the tree was felled um, can be determined pretty well based on the growth rings that we can see. Probably only about five million years beyond the edge of the box of this tree before the tree was felled. If I go to the next slide, please. And the next one again. So I did that for all, um, I went through the same process for the sound box, the neck, and the four pillar. The sound box is key because it was the easiest one and the most clearly defined one in terms of, of how big was the piece of wood um, when it was cut down. Um, if I could uh, have the next slide, please. So this is. This slide shows the adjusted plots based on the date of the last visible growth ring. All this is showing is I've counted from the sample to as far out as I could see to the edge of the worked piece of wood. And um, to let you know what that was, so for the sound box, it was actually 13 years elapsed from where that sample was taken to the edge of the sound box. For the neck, it was 18 years. For the four pillar, it was five years. So we have to add those years on to the date. It makes it that much younger. There's that much less time. Uh, so this shifts the date forward a bit. And um, we think the sound box wood was very likely used within a few years of felling. Um, and also th think that the neck and the sound box were definitely, were, I don't want to say definitely, I want to say highly likely made at the same time based on the workmanship and the record work. Um, 
based on that, uh, um, we, we believe that um, the harp was made either in the second quarter of the 14th century or the first quarter of the 15th century. And um, that, that's a, a significant answer. It makes this one of the oldest surviving medieval stringed instruments in the world. And it um, also, uh, for the first time, we can now say uh, with at least some confidence what century this instrument belongs to. Um, and for the first time, we can say, um, now, here we have a signpost for these very early Irish harps. Before, up to this point, we really couldn't say. And then, you know, some people were saying, oh, well, they're really only, like, they, maybe they only date to the late 16th century, or, you know, well, you know maybe Merlin had it, I don't know. You know um, but, uh, so, I, previously, we were, you know, it would, the best guess was that this was a mid 15th century. And actually, it looks like it's older than that. It looks like it's actually maybe 14th century. And, uh, so now we can start to look at um, what was what was happening musically in the 14th century in the Gallic world, in Europe. Uh, we can also look at uh, the design of this instrument and how it compares with other instruments that from the 14th century or the early 15th century. And this harp, we know from the family and construction, it's actually a very sophisticated design, both mechanically and acoustically, as well as artistically. It's a mature design. It's not something, that, this is not the first of its kind. It's, you know, this is a mature design. Um, and the other thing that we, that the radio carbon dating seems to be telling us is that the four pillar may have been made at the same time as the rest of the harp, uh, which came as a surprise to me. I was expecting the four pillar to be younger than the rest of the instrument. I was actually expecting the four pillar to be uh, from the second half of the 15th century, but it's actually, this shows that no, it's actually, it actually looks like it's as old as the rest of the heart. So that brings forward some other questions. It's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> next slide, please. So, okay. Are, what about other hearts from this time period? Well, okay, so there's the, at Lincoln Cathedral in England, there, in the Angel Choir, there is an angel shown with a heart that is could be uh, an earlier chart or something similar anyway, certainly a big, you know, roughly similar uh, scale and shape. And we know that that angel part uh, sculpture dates to uh, uh, 1275. There's actually good documentation on the sculpture. So that's the late uh, 13th century, last quarter of the 13th century. So certainly, it, there were harps of, you know, possibly this sophistication, this kind of sort of side existing by the uh, last quarter of the 13th century. So it's not inconceivable that uh, the Queen Mary would be an early 14th century one. Uh, what else? So if I get up the next slide, please. One more slide.